Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. The book of Hebrews, chapter number six, verse number one, and it reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. I want to preach this morning or teach this morning from a very simple subject. Um, I'm going to give you a subject and then I'm going to give you a subtopic. My subject this morning is I'm moving on. I'm moving on. And my subtopic is it's time for me to live. Would you look at somebody very quickly and tell them neighbor? It's time for us for us to live. To live. And then point to yourself and declare this over yourself. Say, I, I am moving on. I am moving on. Yes, I am. 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 a lot of messages have been coming back to back. Come out of sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not against the message of holiness and living right. Uh -huh. I'm absolutely for that. Yes, yes. Because the Bible teaches that holiness is still right. Yes, right. From the pulpit to the back door. That's right. But one thing I've come to discover is that we spend so much time on teaching and talking about some of the simplest things such as stay out of somebody's bed, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. quit cussing, uh -huh. quit drinking, quit whatever. Yeah. We spend so much time talking about those things that we never get past that place. That's right. That's right. And so what happens is as long as we keep talking like that and teaching on that and keep reinforcing that, we keep pushing people and pigeonhole, pigeonholing people into a place where we lock ourselves down and that's all we think about. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay, come on. So here's what happens. We have a people because, because we have purpose. Yeah, come on, come on. Because we have purpose on our lives, when we are pigeonholed and locked in to this mindset of just don't sin. And the basic rudimentary stuff of the kingdom of God, because we're locked in there, we get frustrated. Yes. Follow me. Yes. We become frustrated because, and here's what frustration is. When I feel something on the inside of me yes. that's bigger than where I am, yes. and nobody shows me how to get there. Yes. Are y'all going to talk to me yes. up in here? Real frustration is to feel like you got something else on the inside of you that's bigger than where you are right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't know how to get there. You don't know how to go after it. And so you feel like, and I'm, I'm talking to some people, I, I know I hear God right now. I'm talking to some people in this room who feel like you are stuck. Yeah. Can I, can I work in here this morning? You feel like you are stuck. You might have just got a new car. You might have just got a new house. Things might be looking good in your home. But for some reason, because of what's inside you, you still feel like you're stuck. Yes. I'm going to dig a little deep today, so just get ready for the ride. But I got some things God's given me to say. Number one. Much of what we, much of what we have blamed the devil for, uh -huh. he was not even directly involved with. Yes, that's right. Come on, come on. Yes, that's right. Much of what we have blamed the devil for, 
he was not even directly involved with. Now I want you to note the word directly. Uh -huh. Pay attention to that word, directly. Yeah, yeah. Listen, it is often easier for us as Christians to blame the devil for stuff that is going on in our lives than it is for us to take responsibility for stuff that we've done. Stuff goes on and we don't take responsibility or we don't acknowledge that some stuff is just life. And so the first thing we do, and our favorite saying is, you know, the devil is busy. Some stuff ain't the devil being busy. It's people making choices. Here's my next point. The enemy strategy is to create circumstances that facilitate unhealthy environments. His strategy is to create circumstances that facilitate unhealthy environments. Let me let me let me show you what I'm talking about. And, and what happens is when we are in unhealthy places in our mind, in our emotions, in our spirit, unhealthy places in us cause us to make unhealthy decisions. And sometimes, now watch this, I said this, I said the enemy strategy is to create circumstances that facilitate us going into unhealthy environments. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You may have been raped or molested as a child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you have difficulty trusting people. Specifically, you might a lady may have difficulty fully embracing her husband because she's dealt with rape and molestation. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, what has the devil done? He used some sick mind. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you really take it back, they didn't just start with the sick mind. It started behind them. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, somebody introduced them to that stuff. Yeah. Can, can I work a little bit right there? I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. So maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't the person just became a rapist. Maybe it was the porn producer that produced the pornography that that person, the rapist, was watching that got the rapist mindset locked into thinking the way they think. So now somebody else's unhealthiness created unhealthiness in the rapist, and now the rapist came and did something to you. Yeah. And so now down in your spirit, you are living unhealthy. Yes. Unhealthy places. Can I talk about another one? Yes. Abandonment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Maybe mama and daddy weren't there for you. Maybe they left you on grandmama's doorstep. Uh -huh. Those are very real issues. Or oh, watch this. Maybe you develop something in your teenager, your young adult years. Let's say you developed a habit. Maybe you became a drug addict or you became something in your life and, or a prostitute or whatever you may have become. And in you becoming that thing, your family said, I can't walk with you through that anymore. And they left you and abandoned you. Maybe they didn't agree with the person that you married. And they abandoned you. The enemy's job is to create situations and circumstances that facilitate unhealthy places in our lives. What about infidelity? And I'm not just talking about in a love relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend. Some of us have had some friends that have been unfaithful. Yeah, that's oh, y'all not going to talk to me up in here? Some of us have had some friends that have been unfaithful. You shared your deepest secret with them. Next thing you know, you heard your secret out on the street. Am I talking? Have you ever had somebody be unfaithful to you, whether it was a lover or whether it was a friend? And because of their unfaithfulness, now you have difficulty... You watch this. We will all, sometimes we even struggle to even make friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know if I can trust you or not. And if you come into my life, I'm wondering what your motive is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Am I helping somebody right now? 
We find, I know I'm talking to somebody. We find ourselves wondering, well, what's your motive? Yeah. Why you really want to be in my life? Why Why you really want to be my friend? What's your angle? Yes, sir. Come on, come on. Come on. The enemy's strategy is to create for us environments that facilitate unhealthy places. Let me give you one more. A history of financial strain. Some of us know what it means to grow up poor. Can't even afford the last two letters. You just P.O. Poor. Some of us know what it means to have to, not because you wanted to have it, but to have to have government cheese. The little black and white can with the canned meat. Huh? The black and white can with the peanut butter that had the oil floating on the top. <laughs> you had to take your, take your spoon or something and try to stir that stuff up so it would work. And then you put it on your bread and the bread would be towed all up trying to put it on there. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about up in here. None of y'all. But a history of financial strain. And watch this. Some of us, we've watched our grandparents go through it. We've watched mama and daddy them go through it. And so in watching them go through it, we have developed a mindset of poor. Broke. Don't have. And that has become an unhealthy place. Am I making sense to somebody today? And so the enemy has created these environments that are rich with unhealthy places. And from our unhealthy places, we make unhealthy decisions. I'm going somewhere. Just give me a few moments. I'm going somewhere. So watch this. In making our decisions and our choices from unhealthy places, watch this. God... Yes, Lord. Let me give it to you like this. When you make a decision from a good place, uh-huh. for the sake of this, this, this message today, we're going to call those results. Okay. But when we make our decisions from bad places or from unhealthy places, we call those repercussions. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the problem in the body of Christ today, ladies and gentlemen, is what we've been blaming on the devil sometimes has simply been repercussions. Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Some stuff we've been blaming on the devil is not the devil, it's repercussions. And so, watch this, sometimes for the sake of the will of God, God will have mercy on you and not cause you to deal with some of the repercussions you should deal with. Now that's a good shout right there. Because sometimes I thank God. Because if I got everything I deserve, I go, oh, no, I'm not talking. I don't have I don't have a talk back church right there. If I got everything I deserve, where would I be? Can, can anybody can anybody anybody along with me in that right there? If you got everything you really deserve. Sometimes for the sake of the will of God, because watch this, some of us know we deserve to be dead right now. But for, listen what I said now, for the sake of the will of God, many times he will let our, he will have mercy on us and not release to us the full repercussions of our actions. Because he still got to get you somewhere. He still got to get you somewhere. Y'all with me? But watch this. Then there are other times where God does not release you from the repercussions. Why does he not release you from the repercussions? Because if he lets you slide on everything that you do, you would never learn the lessons and you would never learn how to behave. Parents, it is important. If our children are going to grow up to be right, we can't be our children's friend. I'm going to get in trouble right here. 
Oh, I'm, I'm about to dig deep. Trust me, I'm going to dig real deep in just a second. We, 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 we don't understand, but we will love, if, if you don't, if you don't deal with some repercussions in your life, you will never learn the lessons of life that you're supposed to learn. So you ought to thank God that he didn't take you out, but he lets you go through the repercussions and he sustains you through the repercussions. You know good and well you slept with some folks that you should have slept with. Hello? I can't get no help right there. We slept with some folks we should have slept with. Jesus. Probably should have had a disease. And even if there happens to be someone in here who may have gotten something, thank God you're still alive and the disease didn't kill you. See, we don't want to deal with real stuff in church today, but there are people who sit among us and what we tend to do is if they, if they have caught a disease, we try to judge them. No, baby, we're not judging you. We thank God you're still alive. Amen. So we have to understand that there are some things that we can't get out of. Some things we got to go through. You ought to write that down on your paper. Some things I can't get out of. Some things I got to go through. Because I'll never learn the lesson if I don't experience it. We, okay, let me, let me drop this on you and I'm going to move. We, we, we get mad with our employer. Now we showed up late. We five minutes late yeah. every other day. Yeah. And then the employer says, okay, you only got one more time to be late. And then you're going to get written up. Right. And now you're mad because you got written up or you got fired for being late on your job. And you well, I was only five. No, you knew your time that you were supposed to be there was eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And rather than making plans to get there early, you try to get there right on time. And you never knew what was going to come up in your life that could have hindered you from getting there on time. And now you're mad. Yeah. But if you get written up, if you get the repercussion of losing your job, you are dealing with your own repercussions. You can't be mad at anybody else. Amen. That's right. Okay. We make our choices from unhealthy places many times. Mm -hmm. We make choices from some unhealthy places. Let me let me show you one. Fear. Is an unhealthy place. Yes, right. There are people that are watching by live streaming. People that are here in this sanctuary. You're afraid of death. Uh -huh. So you make your decisions in your life. Based on your fear that you're about to die. Uh -huh. You won't go anywhere. You be, you, you're so scared to do anything. Because you're afraid you're going to die. Hello. Come on. Come on. We're afraid. There are people who make decisions. Because they're afraid of being alone. People make decisions because they're afraid of being alone. I don't want to die alone. Uh -huh. So you just go get the next thing that's got uh, breath and britches. <laughs> so you go get breath and britches just so you won't be alone. Knowing good and well they're not compatible with you and you try to make something fit that wasn't designed to fit and when it wasn't designed to fit then you got a whole big mess on your hands all because you were afraid to be alone. Is it alright if I did today and just work a little bit? We got a fear of failure. And because I'm afraid I'm going to fail at something I won't even try. Let me put it on a very basic level. Let me, let me break it all the way down to a basic level. We say things like, well, I don't know that Facebook stuff. Uh -huh. I don't know how to work a computer. Yeah. And rather than making the effort to learn how to work a computer, because we're afraid we're going to mess something up, we don't even try to get at a computer or try to take a class to help us grow. I don't want to, I, I don't know, and, and watch this, and, or we're afraid that we're going to look stupid when we try. I don't want, I don't want to feel like, baby, listen, you never, learn, when you started learning your ABCs, you didn't get those right. Amen. 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 
If you didn't get your ABCs right the first few times you tried it, first 10, 20 times you tried it, you might not get the computer right every time you try it. But if you're going to grow and develop, you're going to have to try something more than where you've been. Somebody say, I'm moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Here's another one. The fear of the unknown. I won't move forward because I don't know what's coming next. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That's a scary place to be. Yeah. I would not be in Knoxville, Tennessee if I had lived by the fear of the unknown. That's right. That's right. But I won't sit here and tell you I didn't deal with the fear of the unknown. Uh -huh. Lord, what are you taking me to? What am I going to do when I get there? How am I going to survive? Because when I got to Knoxville, they'll tell you I didn't have anything. I had my computer to do my work, and I had my business stuff, and I had my clothes. That's all I had when I came to Knoxville. Are y'all with me today? Y'all hear what I'm trying to tell you? The fear of the unknown could have gripped me because it would have been easier for me when my dad died. It would have been far easier for me to go heal in Atlanta where my family is. Yes, that was my plan. Yes. But God said otherwise. He said, you're going to Knoxville. I don't want to go to Knoxville. I don't know nothing. Listen, I don't know anything about that place. Children of Israel messed up. Why? Because when Moses said it's time to go in and possess the land, they said, let's send out some spies and check it out. Uh -huh. Fear of the... Uh -huh. Anybody in here ever dealt with that fear? Yes, sir. Yes. Or you might be dealing with it right now, the fear of the unknown. You're scared to go ask the boss for a promotion because you're afraid of what the boss... For. Fear of the... Uh -huh. Here's another one, another unhealthy place, depression. Yes. Yes. Depression is an unhealthy place. Yes. And watch this. We'll make decisions out of that. If you get depressed, you may have said at the beginning of the year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat right. I'm going to eat my vegetables and my fruit. I'm going to do well. I'm going to exercise. But let you get depressed. Hello? All of that goes out the window. We say, I'm going to eat what I want. I'm going to do what I want. I'm, at this moment, I just don't feel like it. And I'm going to go get what I want. You've been off of cigarettes. You've been off of drinking. Now, all of a sudden, because you're depressed, you're back at it. And, and, and don't, look at, don't look at anybody else around you. <laughs> talk long, talk long, talk. Don't look at anybody else around because our tendency is, well, I don't have what she has. I don't do what she does. But baby, you do something. And it's about time we be honest with ourselves about the stuff that we do to ourselves because that come from unhealthy places. Yes, yes sir. Amen. Woo! will yes. cause you to make decisions yes. that are unhealthy for That's you. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. You go home by yourself every day so you'll make decisions that I got to find me somebody to come be with me because I don't like going home by myself. I'm not talking about just the fear of being home. I'm talking about when you really want somebody to talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let me, can I, can I, can I go right there? I'm, I'm going to dig for my singles right here. I'm gonna, you go home and you are by yourself and you got stuff that's going on in your mind and in your heart and what you really want is intimacy, not sex. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. What you're really after is it's intimacy, not sex. But because you bring unhealthy people into your unhealthy place, you find yourself laid up with somebody in your bed doing stuff you ain't got no business doing. <laughs> why, why ain't nobody place? Here's one more for you. I got, I got two, two, three more for you. Then I'm going to move on and, and, and take you on home. Grief is an unhealthy place. Yes, it is. I'm talking about depression, but grief is an unhealthy place. Because watch this. Grief, anytime, listen closely to this. You may want to write this down. Anytime you deal with a loss, you deal with grief. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. And there is a grieving process yes. that you go through uh -huh. when you deal with a loss. Yes. Uh -huh. 
Okay? Yes, sir. Immediately, everybody thinks of the death of a loved one, right? That's the first thing we think about. But let's go past that. Yeah. You lose a job yeah. that you've been working on and you were happy at. Yeah. When they walk in and they tell you, we thank you for your services, but we're going to have to release you. You're going to deal with some grief because you're going to deal with all this stuff on the inside. Yeah. If you messed it up, you're going to be dealing with all this stuff. Well, why, man, I should have done better. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or if you feel like they weren't justified in releasing, you're going to deal with the grief of the separation because you feel like they weren't justified in what they did. Uh -huh. But either way it goes, you're going to deal with some grief. Yeah. Anytime there is a loss, there will be a grieving process. If you had $50,000 in the bank and now you're down to two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I promise you, first lady, you're going to grieve a little bit. Bishop, you're going to grieve a little bit. When you go from making good money down to. Do I have some folk talking to me in here? That's some grief that comes on you. And what we do is in those grieving moments, we make decisions. Watch this. Okay, you take a loss. Sometimes in our attitude, because we're grieving, our attitude gets off. We treat people who love us and care for us in the wrong way because we are grieving. Can I help somebody right here? You, oh, Jesus, help me. I really feel like teaching this morning. Y'all. Listen, listen. It is important. Now, this is not for the grieving person. This is for people who are around someone who might be grieving. Yeah. First of all, you have to learn how to embrace the fact that they are actually grieving and recognize that they're in a grieving process. If somebody loses their job, they're in a grieving process. And rather than pointing out all the stuff y'all got to get taken care of and all the stuff that's going on in your house, Take some time in that moment and encourage them because in that moment while they're grieving, they feel down and despair. They feel weak. They feel hurt. So give them something to help push them up rather than knock them down. And you say, well, I'm just speaking reality. Sometimes they don't need reality in that moment. Sometimes they need just somebody who can help them get through the grief. Sometimes I need somebody to just help me get through my grief. If I can get through my grief, I'm going to be all right. I don't forget that I have responsibilities, things I got to take care of. I just need to get through my grief. That's true. Come on. And watch this. And, and I, I, I can sometimes I can only talk for myself. I remember right after my grandmother died and around the time that my father was ailing and, and people had this expectation. Y'all know I'm a graphic designer. And so people had this expectation. They still wanted me to operate at 100 uh percent. -huh. Here I am, an elder of my church. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm working two jobs, basically trying to just make things meet for my family. My wife wasn't working at the time. And so here I am with all of that on me, and then the church is expecting me to keep doing graphic design and get everything done on the time frame they wanted me to get it done, and they didn't understand that I was grieving. They figured because my grandmama died in July and it's now November that I can't possibly be grieving anymore. People will try to tell you, I, I don't know who I'm helping right now, and whatever your grieving place is, people will try to tell you, you should be over it by now. Nobody can dictate to you what your grieving process is supposed to look like. Just because they got past it in a month or two doesn't mean you have, you're going to. Now, I'm not encouraging you to live in the place of grief, but I'm telling you, you're going to have to go through the process. I just hear, I hit something in the Holy Ghost and I started talking about grief and I feel it in this atmosphere. I decree healing over every person who is dealing with grieving in your spirit right now. You have dealt with some sort of loss in your life and you've been crying. And I see somebody's been crying behind the scenes 
Your family didn't see you cry. You were crying in your car. You were crying when you were by yourself. And sometimes it wasn't even external tears that you were crying. Sometimes they were internal tears that you were crying because something was hurting in you and you were grieving and people didn't understand. But today in the name of the Lord, I decree healing over you now. Be healed in the name of the Lord. Be healed in the name of the Lord. I send the word of healing back there to you. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Mr. Sandra, go quick, quick, quick. Go back there. Just put your hand on her back and declare healing from her grieving. Thank you, Jesus. I told you I'm in a different place now. If you're in here and you're grieving, you ought to just slip your hands up and say, I receive my healing. Receive your healing right now. Whatever you might be grieving from, I dare call on Shotlet and your side. Receive your healing now in the name of Jesus. It doesn't mean that everything just going to suddenly end, but it means that you're going to be able to have a better opportunity to get through it. Insecurity. Insecurity is an unhealthy place. Sometimes you grew up and people told you that you were stupid. They told you you'd never amount to anything. Not show out the side. They told you that you were slow. They told you you'd never be anything. They told you this is all you're gonna ever be. They told you this is all you're gonna ever be in your life. They spoke over you that you were fast. They called you a hoe. Even at a young age, they, they talked bad about you. Yes. Oh, they said things like, you just like your mama. Mm. You just like your daddy. Yes, yes, yes. And it, it, it has left a stigma yes. on your life. Yes. It has left something in your mind that has hurt you, that is, you've carried it through your life. You've been carrying this stuff and you don't know Lord how much, and it has created an insecurity so you feel like you're not good enough. Yes. Nothing I ever do is good enough. I'm doing the best I can, but it's not good enough. And sometimes it's not people telling you it's not good enough, but when it's when you go sit down at your dining room table with that stack of bills at the beginning of the month. Yes. I can't hear nobody. Come on, come on. And you know you're working all the hours you can work. You're doing the best you can, trying to bring in your money. And you're doing all of this. And you're looking at that stack of bills and you don't have enough money to match your month. Yes. Oh, Am I making sense to somebody? Yes. And even in that, in that moment when you're sitting there and you've got that going on, you feel like you're not good enough. Insecurity. Yes. Uh -huh. Let me give you one last one. Now, this, doesn't, this is not an all-inclusive list, but I'm just touching a few things that the Holy Ghost put on my heart to give to you today. Yeah. Listen. Guilt and regret are unhealthy places. Yes. And we can make decisions out of our places of guilt and regret. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. yes. Have any of you ever made some decisions out of guilt? Yes. Out of regret? Yes. I'm going to talk about one real quick. Yeah. I try to be my child's friend. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about in general. A person tries to be their child's friend. They don't want to be their disciplinarian because maybe... Maybe I feel a sense of regret because I wasn't there for my other children. Mm. Maybe I didn't do so well with this one, so I'm going to try to be friends with this one. So we, so we don't discipline. We don't do the things we need to do. We want to be the child's friend. No, we can't do that because by doing that we bring damage to the child. But in our, watch this, and what we try, oh, here's another example. What we try to do is we try to buy them everything. Say that one more time. We try to buy them everything they want. 
It's called Amen. overcompensation. When we have been broken, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me dig a little deeper. Maybe it's not because you didn't get it right with your children, but maybe it's because your parents didn't get it right with you. So now you feel such a sense of regret that they didn't get it right with you. So now what you do is you try to make up for what you, I'm not going to let my children go through what I had to go through. But that's not healthy. I'm trying to help somebody today. See, and, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning of my message. I'm getting ready to round third base and close this thing, y'all. But what I was talking about is when we talk about, so many times we're talking about sin, sin, sin. Don't sin, don't sin. But people are living with the results of things that are going on in their lives. And sometimes it's not that we're intentionally living in sin, but it's because so much is happening that we can't focus on trying to move forward. Yeah. Here's what I believe, ladies and gentlemen. I believe we won't have to spend so much time preaching folks, stay out of bed, stay out of sin, if we could ever help you get to the place where you understand who you are in Christ. And if we can ever get, watch this, watch this, watch this. No two thoughts can operate in your mind at the exact same time. Amen. Stay with me. Well, Steve, you cannot have two thoughts in your mind at the exact same moment. You can have one right after the other and they might come very quickly, but you can never have two operating at the same time. Well, what does that mean? Why do you say that? Why did you bring that up, Long? I brought that up to you because watch this. If my mind and my energy is focused on moving forward in my life and honoring God with the way I live and honoring, I'm not just talking about staying out of sin. I'm talking about fulfilling purpose. Yes. Whatever he designed me for. If I'm so focused on fulfilling purpose, I'm not thinking about sinning. Yes. Hello? If I'm, okay, if I'm designed to work in the community and be a community activist, if I'm busy working in the community and being a community activist and showing people the love of God in the community, guess what? I got very little time to be worried about who's going to be sleeping in my bed. Right. Okay, I got very little time to be listening to and perpetuating gossip if I'm doing my assignment in the earth. Yes. Am I helping? Because see, y'all think sin is the only sex is the only sin. If I focus on bringing other people encouragement and happiness in their life, baby, I don't have time to sit there and be unforgiving and hateful in mine. Because two thoughts cannot operate in your mind at the same time. So if I'm focused on encouraging you, I'm not going to be focusing on tearing them down. Somebody holler, I'm moving on. Let me, let me get ready to go out of here. I got to go. I got to go. I've been, I've been before you just long enough. So I'm trying to tell you today, what I'm trying to get to is, the Lord has declared, I want you to live. Sometimes we become so focused, I'm about to close this now, sometimes we become so focused on our life experiences that we forget how to live. Yeah. Well, I come today to preach to some folk that are ready to live. Yeah. You're ready to step up into a new place. You're ready to live. See, and, and what happens is when you get through dealing with all this stuff from the unhealthy place and you say, God, I need you to make me healthy again, make me whole again, what can happen is when God starts speaking to your life, you can trust him with what he said. Oh, y'all not talking. You can trust him with what he said. So when he tells you to step out and start the business, you might be, see, sometimes we're so concerned about whether we can trust God, we can we feel like we can't trust him because we got so many unhealthy places. We can't trust everybody else, so obviously we can only trust God to a certain limit. No, baby, you can trust God with everything about your life. He knows what's best for you. He knows what his plans for you. I hear Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. He knows what his plans are for your life. Tell somebody tell them I'm moving on. I, I'm not staying where I've been. It's time for me to come up. I'm ready to live now. I'm coming to the place 
so I'm ready to live. Is there anybody in here, Lord, I feel a holler coming on. Is there anybody in here who says, I'm ready to live now? I'm tired of just existing. So now I'm going to go to God and get healed from my grief. Healed from my insecurity. Healed from my past. Healed from the stuff that hurt me. Healed from being let down. Healed from being abandoned. Healed from all of that stuff. I'm not living in fear anymore. But I'm going to start walking by faith and not by sight. I'm going to trust God with everything. And if I can trust Him with everything, I have decided. Lord, have mercy. I'm moving on. You ought to touch somebody and say, oh, neighbor, I'm moving on. I'm planning to live now. I know I'm 40 years old. I know I'm 50 years old. I know I'm 60 years old. You might have been in that place. You're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and you still haven't lived. You ought to determine it as of today. I plan to live. Yes, can I close it right here? Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that you have it more abundantly. You ought to get ready that as of today, I plan to live. I plan to live an abundant life. I'm not going to live the way I used to live. I'm not just going to exist. I'm not going to be walking around carrying my pain. But as of today, Uh-uh. 
I want, what is God's plan for my life? Yes. Can I get a talk to that church? Yes. Right. What does God have for me? Yes. What is my purpose? Yes. What am I in the earth for? Yes. Yes. God, I feel like screaming in here. Yes. I'm not in here just to be a church member. Yes. What is my purpose? Yes. What did you make me for? Yeah. You made me for more than just coming to church. That's right. You made me to help build the kingdom. Now, what is my part to build the kingdom? Yes. And it's bigger than just preaching. That's right. Okay, can I can I can I just give you one thing and I'm gonna get out your way? Yeah. Some of us, all right, you know. I said this before, first lady. You know, there are people who are always trying to start all these different organizations and stuff like that. Sometimes they're not ordained to start the organization. Sometimes they need to connect with something that's already going on. We we we'll get involved in stuff, and we say, well, "I'm gonna start this," but you don't have the wherewithal to go ahead to take that that thing to a whole other level. So sometimes your appointment is to be a volunteer and help with something somebody else is doing. That's right. Some child can use your love just in you volunteering somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's building kingdom. Yeah. Come on. See, Come see, on. see, I ain't talking about shouting and dancing now. That's yeah. right. All right. All right. Work. 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 I'm talking about doing the work of the kingdom. Yeah. Work. Understanding that God loves you regardless. So it's not even a, you working for the kingdom yeah. has nothing to do with getting approval from God. That's right. That's right. That's right. Come on, come on. Oh, it has nothing to do with it. See, what, what we've been taught in the church is you got to do this, do that, do this, so God will approve you and everything will be all right. No, baby. God loves you. Amen. Period. Amen. Flaws and all. Yes. He loves you too much to let you stay that way, but he loves you right where you are. So here's my point, and I'm done. All right. Every one of us has an assignment. And if we spend all of our time with all the church language, mm -hmm. stay here do, and, and do this and do that and do this, you'll never experience the fullness of who he created you to be. Right? Mm -hmm. If I had listened, Bishop, to some of the naysayers, mm -hmm. I would have never stepped into being a public speaker beyond church. Because mm -hmm. naysayers said, oh, they, 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 they would go to my pastor uh -huh. and they would say, Pastor, he's trying to build his own kingdom. He's trying to build his own kingdom. He's trying to be all of that. No, I was just trying to be who I was called to be. I was just being who I was called to be. So, in being who I was called to be, God. They, the folk got mad. I'm, I'm going to help somebody right here. And I'm, I'm, Lord, please forgive me, y'all. Come, come on, come on. Please forgive me. But people, you ought not to trip <laughs> because folk don't like your purpose. That's right. That's right. When you start becoming who you're supposed to become, <laughs> when you finally get a grip on the fact that they're, they're not supposed to like you, that's right. <laughs> Because you become, yes. I, I yes. stop, I stop. But you become a mirror to them, and when you start doing what you're supposed to do, you reveal to them what they're not doing, and that's why they get angry. Amen.
I decree life over every person in this room. People who've been living in a dead place. I speak life to them now in the name of Jesus. I speak wholeness from the unhealthy places. Snatch us out today. God, don't just slowly draw us out, but snatch us out of the unhealthy places. Snatch us out of unhealthy mindsets. Snatch us out of unhealthy habits. Snatch us out of unhealthy behaviors. So that we can be fully effective for the kingdom. Yes. In the name of Jesus. I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I give you glory and honor. In Jesus mighty name. And everyone that you receive it said. Amen. 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 I do want to open the floor if anybody.